No, I can't get a boat down it. So think of it like that. If they can get a boat down it, they're not going to allow you to own their water, so you would only own to the bank. The other type of water is a lake, Littoral. which is littoral rights. And in that scenario, we only own to the average high water mark. The boat sits out here. Here's the boat. Lake Michigan, the ocean, Lake Okeechobee. So those are the two types of waters we have, a lake and a river. One is riparian, one is littoral. All right. And remember this, we, we talked about this earlier. There's the earth we own to the center and to the heavens above. This would be the definition of land. It also includes all of the naturally occurring stuff the tree, the plants, and all of that. That is the definition of land. Now we go in, we build a house on that. That house has a name. It is called an improvement. Remember anything man-made. Now land plus the house is called real estate. And then when we add the five rights to it, it is called real property. So think of it like a math equation. You've got the land plus the improvements plus all of the rights comprise real property. So I know there's a couple questions in there that ask you about which one of these is real property, which one of these is real estate. So think of it like an equation. You've got these three parts. You've got the land. Then when you add houses, you got real estate. And then when you add the uh, rights, you have real property. So this would be land. When you add the improvements, it becomes real estate. And then when you add the rights, it becomes real property. I have a question. Sure. So after the improvements have been made and everything is now real property, you go to sell your property and I go to buy and purchase it. I purchase it because you have these cool speakers set into the real property. One of those being the fixtures. Now, in regards to the fixtures being part of real property, you go and remove them before I uh, purchase the property. How? How do you fix that? I don't, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but it's like you you took that fixture out. I assumed it was real property. It was never anything said in the contract about it. How, how do well, I get that real property back? All right. So to answer your question, let me clarify. If you, if I listed my house and I've got a really cool set of speakers that are embedded in the ceiling, for surround sound. Now, as a listing agent, before that, so let's work at this in progress. As a listing agent, I would say, hey, Shauna, I see you got cool speakers. And you go, yeah, I'm taking those with me. 
by definition, they would be part of real estate because they are fixture. Mm -hmm. I would have to tell you, we need to take those out of the ceiling before someone sees it, because if they see it up there, they're going to assume it would be part of the deal right. because they are attached. That's one option. I could let you see the house, but in my listing agreement, I would tell you something like, speakers will be removed and go with the seller. I would put that in the listing agreement because he, maybe he doesn't want to take them out before we list it because then he couldn't hear his TV. So he can't take it out in some cases. So you would actually exclude them in your listing. Well, that didn't work. Remember, and we talked about this thing called severance. Right. Where you sever the real property. So you would actually turn it to personal property. You would take those speakers out and then take them with you. Severance, let me, that's actually a bad drawing. turns real into personal property. So I would sever them and I could either do it one of two ways. I could take the speakers out before I listed it, or in some cases you can't take it out. You would do it verbally or manually in the listing agreement by telling all of the agents in advance, hey, you're gonna see these, but they're not gonna be here. So I have severed it. Okay. And I have taken that real property because by definition, a fixture is real property and turned it into personal and I'll be taking it with me when I leave. I don't know. I hope I answered your question. Kind of. It's like this, like, okay. So I understand several severance and all of that, but say that that never even occurred. And you know how you were saying that it's upon the buyers, uh, it's in good intentions for the buyer to do like a final walkthrough before the f official closing where they do like the three days before they do a walkthrough, right? And say you did your walkthrough and everything was in place. You go to close and... <laughs> So you go to close and then when you go back to the house, the speakers are gone. Okay. So you just place the locks. <laughs> That's how yeah. you get it back. I get what right. you're so this happens. We had this happen just recently. Buyer, we walked through the house. We saw everything. We made an offer on everything which included in this particular case, the washer and the dryer. And they said, yes, we went to the walkthrough and they had taken them. So we actually had to call the seller and say, you need to bring back right. the washer and dryer or we're not going to close. Now, that's through the final walkthrough. What happens if my guy didn't go to the final walkthrough? This is why we advocate as agents, our clients go through a walkthrough. Because let's say we didn't do it. He went and closed on the house. He went home and saw that. That's where you're at now. Now. Hopefully you would call the other agent and say, hey, you better call your sellers and do the right thing because we put an offer in and asked for the washer and dryer. You have said yes. We now found out you didn't leave them. Maybe it was a mistake. They better bring them back. 
And literally, that's what happened. They brought the refrigerator back. In our particular case, it was a refrigerator. And they brought it back. So let me Once ask you, when taking this test, though, with a question like that, because there's something similar, probably I don't have it down verbatim what that question was, but it's some similarities there. Don't think too much into it, like, okay, because that was my first initial thought, like, well, why wouldn't I contact the other broker and be like, hey, this is what's going on. You all need to figure it out with the seller. Should I just stay more um, direct <laughs> on the yeah. question? Well, okay. I think in the order, and that would be a shitty question personally, in the order of the way that you would do it would be like that. Contact you would hope walk. to catch it at walkthrough. If you closed, you would contact the other agent and hope they would do the right thing. Ultimately, it would boil down to this as the final final answer. If they... If you called and said, hey, you were supposed to leave the washer and dryer, you didn't bring it back, and they're like, oh, we're not doing it. And they breached the contract, you would have to actually file a lawsuit and let the judge determine. So I joked when I put this, this would probably be your last, your last effort. Hopefully you catch it here, but probably based on the question that you asked, Simple communication with the other agent hopefully would solve that problem. All right. All right. That is the first portion of this first chapter. All right. All right. So we're back. Let's talk to this next section. They want us to look at if I can get this work in here is a section that people tend to have a lot of problem with. Once again, we are still in uh, ownership and there are many different types of ownership. There's actually three different types of ownership. So boom, we have a Single owner. What's a single owner called? Severed. Severed. Say it again. Oh, severity. It's pronounced like the word. Several. 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 Yeah. T. T. Yeah, severity. Which screws with you because several means many. Where this comes from is the word to sever yourself from the rest of the public by being the sole owner. So if you are a sole owner, you own property in severalty. A corporation is one person, a partnership is one person, an LLC is one people. All of them are legal entities, so they would own property in severalty. Even though Coca-Cola may be run by a board of directors, it is still owns it in the name of a company that is one person. So corporations would own property in several people, okay? The second form to own property Joint. is in some form of co-ownership, and there are two of these. The first Joint. one is called a tick, Tenancy which stands in for tenants in common, all right? So the only thing they have in common are the tenants. The tenancy, the ability to be in the property. So the only unity is the word they use. The only unity they have is possession. That's the only thing that all 14 of us get to share is the possession of the property. And like I have said before, I draw this like a pie because I want you to see that different people can have different amounts. There is no requirement for us to have equal shares. And the word the book loves is disproportional. Disproportional because this person owns 5%, this person owns 6%, this person owns 7%, 
eleven eighteen. This person would own twelve percent. That's not even close to being right, Matt. <laughs> um, what is that? Eleven eighteen fifties thirty two. They would own thirty two percent. All right. So disproportional shares. They can own different amounts. But what you need to understand about their amounts is that they are also undividable. Meaning this guy here, Bob, cannot take 7% of all of the chairs. So if you had, you know, 10 chairs or whatever, those are chairs. He can't go, well, these are my 7%. I'm taking it and leaving. Can't do that. They are undividable, meaning he owns 7% of every chair. And one other guy owns 6%. That's his portion there. And this guy, letter E, owns half. half of every chair you guys get that that is a very hard key concept disproportional and undividable disproportional means they have different amounts undividable means they cannot take you can't divide each the total and say i'll take seven percent they own seven percent of everything Are we cool? Thumbs up. Now, the, the, the other good thing about a tenant in common is it allows this person to actually sell their property and bring sell it just like real property. So Darren wants out of our group. Darren can literally just put it up for sale and sell it. Darren were to pass away, it would go into his will, and now his kid would be our new tenant in common because it can be transferred by will. All right. Yeah. So I thought that when you wanted to, or is this cooperative where you have to first offer it to the to the other members first? The first the right of first refusal. All right. Do not confuse the technical aspect with what would probably happen in the real world. Okay. In the real world, probably what you're saying is true. Darren would probably come to one of us because we have an agreement that says, hey, Daryl, Dar Darren, I'm sorry, not Daryl. Hey, Darren, you want to sell? Give one of us a shot first. Mm -hmm. That's not required in the technical aspect. So I don't want you to get confused with that. Okay. The technical is this section here is treated just like a regular house. In the real definition of a tenant in common, Darren has the right to do with it whatever he wants. He could lease it out, he could sell it, he could die and put it in his will. All right, that's the technical portion I want you to understand. What you ask is probably true amongst logical people that would have an agreement and go, hey, I want to buy it. But that's not a law. The law is he can treat it however, he, just like his house. Sells mm -hmm. it, buys it, leases it wills it away, gives it away, does whatever he wants without really required to ask us. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the second one of these, I'm going to move that over here, is this thing called a joint tenant. Think of the word as joint, meaning locked in, because now... We have four things that we need to share. 
And I always picture this one like a glass of water. The reason I like a glass of water is because you cannot pour the middle section out. You just can't. You, you, you mess the whole thing up. So we still have this unity. We still get to possess it all at one time. But we must also have the same interest amount. Over here, they were disproportional. Over here, they must be proportional. So if there's four of us, we must by law own 25%. They must be proportional. If there's five of you, you each own 20%. All right. Now, it is still undividable. Meaning I cannot take there, here's the four chairs again. I can't take one of these and go, that's 25%. I'll take my one chair and leave. No, you cannot do that. That is not allowed. It is still disproportional, meaning I own technically 25% of every chair. If somebody else owns 25%. And the third guy owns 25%. And the fourth guy owns 25%. They are undividable. We also got all of these at the same time. Hey, Brandon, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is it possible? I'm having like a lot of back noise. Can somebody that's on a phone keeps turning it on. I just muted everybody. Yeah, somebody on there's got some if some background noise. So I've paused everybody or I've turned everybody uh muted them. All right. If you have a question, unmute and come on. But I've paused, I've muted everybody so you there is no background noise. Are we good? All right. The other thing about a joint tenant is we get it at the same time. Typically, they are by an act of law, like the reading of a will or the marriage or something like that. And they have all on the same title work. So for instance, this one's going to have one title work that will say, okay. Bob, Bill, Sue, and Mary as joint tenants to the property. So one title work, four names. Over here, this guy's going to have A as 5% owner. There's going to be one here, B as 6% owner. So there's a title work there, a title work there, a title work there, a title work there, and a title work there. So the key thing is this joint tenant has to have all four of these unities in place to be a joint tenant. It is required by rule that they all have to be, all four of them have to be in place. Possession, interest, time, and title. That's the big definition. 
Now, here's the other key to this, and this is very important. In this, when one of them die, his portion gets divided amongst the remaining members. It cannot be sold. It can't be given away. It cannot be willed. I know that somebody told me once that there was a question that says something to the effect of, if the property was given by will to the grandfather, well, as soon as you hear that, you know it cannot be a joint tenant because if the grandfather died as a joint tenant, his portion would be given to the remaining members. It wouldn't be in a will. So Quick there, question. Yeah. So joint tenancy, basically, it kind of is like husband and wife. And then tenant in common is probably like four investors going in to buy properties. Is that like the easier way to think about it? That would be a good way to think about it. Husband and wife are a very special joint tenancy. Mm -hmm. All right. Theoretically, Shauna and I could buy a property as joint tenants. All right. She, we would both, even though we're not married. So thinking of it as a husband and wife is okay, as long as you understand you don't have to be married. Anybody can do it. You would just declare it when we buy the deal. If me and Darren and Shauna went in together and decided we were going to buy a rental property, we could say we are joint tenants when we do it. Now, all three of us bought that property together. When it comes to signing, do we all have to be present since it's going to be all on one title to sign yes. at the same time? Yes. We okay. would all have to be at the closing, and it would say Raymond, Derek, and Lashana as joint tenants to the property located at 12 Smith Street. Now, notice in that definition, I didn't say we each own 33%. Why? Why didn't it say that? Because it's um, a possession. We all have our equal amount of shares, right? Right. Because by joint tenant definition, we can't have anything other than yeah. one third, one third, and one third. So they don't say that in a joint tenant title work. They just name the people, Bob, Sue, Bill, and Mary, as joint tenants. They don't need to say, 25% owners because there's four of them. And by rule, joint tenants have to have equal portion. Now, if Raymond, Darren, and Shauna bought it as tenants in common, now each one of us individually would have our own title work. And mine would say Raymond Modulin as 20% owner of the tenant in common at 12 Smith Street. Darren's would say, Darren as 30% owner of the property at 12 Smith Street. And Shauna's would say, Shauna as 50% owner of the tenants in common of 12 Smith Street. Three title works, and each one of them would identify our specific portion. Because that's what tenants in common mean. Now, I get mad at Darren and Shauna one day, and I'm like, I literally can list my property and sell it without talking to either one of them because tenants in common can do that. Mm -hmm. Now, like uh, he said, the smart thing is I'd probably talk to one of those two if I really wanted to sell it. Hey, you want to buy my share? But the rule is I don't have to because they're treated like regular property. If I die, my kids get my portion. I put it in my will. Now let's go back. If we were joint tenants and I died, Darren and Shauna would split my portion and mm -hmm. 
the, my children would get nothing of it because